I'd like to ask that you bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, thank you for the divine lessons in this amazing lesson book that you've given to us. And Father, I don't have the ability to explain and explain with the tongue of heaven the, these beautiful things, but I ask that they would become clear to our minds and that we would walk away with a sense of awe and wonder at the salvation that you've provided. In Jesus' name, amen. My understanding of the last couple of weeks, we've had some interesting things around Hollister. Praise God for those of you that made it to the motorcycle rally. I don't know if a rally is a good word. I think it's more like an invasion, isn't it? <laughs> and they're really excited to hear the good news about that. Also, there's another kind of invasion. We've had young adults going door to door, knocking on doors, offering religious and other literature at homes. How many of you are aware of that? Any of you aware? Okay. Very exciting. It's something that we have had no part in. We've had to do nothing. We've spent no money. We've, we haven't had, unless you've bought books from them, that is. We haven't opened our homes to them or, or put them up for the night or fed them any meals. But there is something that we can do. Next Sabbath, they're going to be here telling about their stories of going to our neighbors. And I'm not going to miss that, and I wouldn't miss it if I were you either. Because if you haven't heard, angels have joined them periodically. Credible stories of what God is doing with these young people. Hearts are being opened. There's a number of people that have spiritual interest. Some of them are even requesting Bible studies, and they may need a little bit of our help. There's going to be a training next Sabbath afternoon. How many of you might be open to see whether you can be of help in connecting with some of these people that show in spiritual interest? Would you join me at the training? I know it'll, it's a Sabbath afternoon. It's a groggy time after lunch, but we've got Nelson Ernst, who will be here from the conference who's gifted in this area, he will make it simple and easy to follow up. And I wouldn't miss this for anything. I've entitled today's remarks, The Scent of Judgment. Who are you? I mean, who are you? I mean, it's a Saturday morning. You're seated in a Seventh-day Adventist church. You're listening to a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. Who are you? And most of you would say, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. But what's that? You would, yes, you would say a Seventh-day Adventist. Who said that? Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Hmm. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. What is a Seventh-day Adventist? Some of you would say, well, a Seventh-day Adventist is somebody that keeps Saturday holy as the Bible Sabbath. Yes, but so do the Seventh-day Pentecostals and the Seventh-day Baptists. Well, Pastor, what about the return of Jesus? We believe in his soon return. Yes, but so do many evangelicals with us, and some of them even hold an identical view as ours. Well, Pastor, we believe that death is asleep. Yes, so do the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Pastor, we believe that death, that, that hell actually comes to an end. Yes, and many Christians from many denominations are coming to that conclusion, many included in the Church of Christ. Oh, Pastor, but, well, we believe that our body is the temple of God. Oh, have you ever heard Joel Olstein preach about 
telling his congregation, don't eat shrimp, catfish, pork, and all those unclean meats. Any of you ever heard that? We're not alone anymore. Oh, pastor, we believe that there's an end-time gift of prophecy. There's many denominations that believed in the perpetuity of spiritual gifts, and there's at least one denomination that also believes in, the end, in an end-time prophet. Pastor, we believe in uh, a unique understanding of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. You know where we got those? They came straight out of the 1800s from the Baptist and the Methodist. We took the core of those teachings, we studied them, examined them, asked, is this biblical, is this biblical, and we incorporated them. And of course, we've gone much further, but we're not alone. You know what really makes us unique? What makes us unique as a people is that God has given to every movement that he has raised up, he has given to every movement a pivotal, pivotal teaching. He gave it in brief to Adam and Eve, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It was a teaching that was a part of the believers, true believers of the time of Christ and was foundational in the early church. It was a teaching that was given to Moses in all of its beauty. It was a teaching called the sanctuary. You'd say, well, Pastor, other people have an understanding of the sanctuary. Yes, but there's more to it than that. Because you see, the sanctuary is the clearest representation of the character of God, of anything that's out there. And if you want to find out how God deals with broken, fallen, sinful human beings like us, go to the sanctuary. If you want to understand how God redeems me from sin and self-destruction, go to the sanctuary. Because how God acts and who He is is revealed there. Have you not read, Thy way is in the sanctuary, O God? That's what David said. God, I understand you because I understand who you are through the sanctuary. We as a people have an interconnected, interlocking series of truths, all of them anchored in the sanctuary. You see, it's tempting for us to believe that just because I go to church on Saturday that that makes me unique. I had a number of members, church members coming to me several years back saying, Oh, Pastor, it's so exciting. We've discovered this evangelical church up on the east side of Bakersfield and they're keeping Saturday. Their pastor is keeping it. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Oh, and Pastor, he even believes in the sanctuary. And you, and you would discover that by going to his church. And I, I was there for a funeral service, and right up front he had a uh, large replica of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Spray-painted gold, of course. Replica in the back, in the foyer of the uh, uh, table of showbread. And uh, really kind of cool. We were praising God about it. There was a young couple that had recently become Seventh-day Adventists at one of our evangelistic meetings, they ended up going to this church, this evangelical church that was meeting on Saturday, and they became a part of the worship team, they became a part of the teachings team and the church staff. I believe they even received some income. But about two and a half, two years later, they showed up at a convocation of all the Adventist churches in town, and they came up to me and they said, Pastor, you know we've been attending the and they, they, they named the church. I'm not going to name it here. And I said, yes, I'm aware of it, and my prayers have been with you. They said, well, thank you for that, but it's time for us to move on. We need to be a part of a church that believes all the truth. Because they had come to the realization that it's not just one little teaching here or one teaching here that makes us unique as a people. 
It's an interconnected, interlocking series of truths anchored in the sanctuary. And when you look at our teachings today, you will find that they are all out of the sanctuary, at least the majority of them. Jesus is the Lamb, salvation by grace alone, the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath. Guess where you find the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath and the sanctuary? Where do you find them? In the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus the Lamb you encounter at the very beginning, at the, at the courtyard. The whole great controversy is being played out. The second coming and even the, an end time judgment revealed there in the sanctuary. You and I are a part of a movement. Really, a movement is a good way of putting it. Because the teachings we have are designed to move us forward. As a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, it's not enough just to simply see the Lamb and say, Hallelujah, I believe in the Lamb. Thank you, I embrace the Lamb and stay right there. No, God wants us to move forward to the labor and to be baptized and into the whole, most whole, holy place, that is, and receive the benefit of the Word and the Spirit and prayer and then finally into the Holy of Holies where God finishes His cleansing touches on us. It's designed to move us from earth to the kingdom, from the cross to the kingdom, step by step in the shadow of the cross. One of those core teachings, and really the essence of the sanctuary, is moving from the lamb that was slain We follow him as he moves to heaven itself as our great high priest. And we follow him by faith as he moves into that final judgment. Judgment's not a word we're comfortable with. It's not a word that most Christians are comfortable with. But it's a biblical concept. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and there were many of my colleagues, fellow ministers, that simply laid this teaching aside and said, look, it's a sectarian teaching. There's no truth to it. I'd like to challenge you that the teaching about the Day of Atonement and the Day of Judgment is foundational not only to our faith, but absolutely bedrock essential to your ultimate salvation. I sat and I listened to a former Seventh-day Adventist theologian down in Southern California in a church there one Sabbath. And he made a bold, sweeping statement. He said, there's no evidence in Scripture that there is any kind of evidence End time, pre-advent, no, no, he said there's no evidence in Scripture of anything that approaches the investigative judgment. He says the word isn't even used in Scripture, and I will grant him that. But you know what? When Adam and Eve sinned, God showed up. Did he immediately move to judgment? He said, where are you? What's been going on? Why are you hiding from me? Did you do this? He investigated before passing judgment. And when God showed up in the antediluvian world and he saw that the hearts of man were only evil continually, he investigated. And then he said, look, there's going to be a period of, what, about a 100 years or so, and I'm going to give you some probation, and then judgment will fall. There's investigation and then judgment. Same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus and two angels shows up in the tent of Abraham. You know this is true. And he says, look, I've come down to see whether the cry that is coming up to heaven is true or not. Did he know? Of course he knew. But he's establishing a precedent that he investigates before passing judgment. Over and over again, you can see that this took place in the time of Christ. In fact, throughout Scripture, there is judgment after judgment. Notice this. There was judgment passed on the early world, on the uh, antediluvian world by the flood. There was judgment by fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. 
There was judgment on the entire nation of Egypt, and it resulted in the freeing of God's people. There was judgment on God's people in the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. There was judgment in the time of Christ. There were many judgments throughout history. Are you seeing that? But the Bible predicts that there will be one end time judgment. Before, I've spent a whole sermon just on this, but I'm not going to. I think it's pretty easy to prove that there is an end time judgment. I was preaching this in a congregation that was about a third this size early on in my ministry, and a wealthy banker in the back stood up. He said, Pastor, are you saying that there's judgment that takes place before Jesus comes? I said, yeah. He said, well, I don't believe it because Matthew 25 says that when Jesus comes, he gathers both the sheep and the goats together and he passes judgment on them. I said, brother, that's a great question you bring up. But what do you do with Revelation chapter 22, verse 12? Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. When Jesus comes, what does he have with him? He has a what? He has a reward. And when Jesus comes, he has a reward. And to some people, that will be a good reward, and to some, it will not be such a good reward. Amen? What do you call that process, I asked him? What do you call that process by which you determine whether somebody gets a good reward or not? What do you call that process? I don't know what you call it. I call it judgment. You see, a judgment has to take place prior to the second coming, prior to Jesus coming, for him to be able to give the rewards. And I said, let's turn over to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, same pattern. There's an investigative judgment. The the judgment is finished, and then Jesus shows up. Revelation chapter 14, same thing. There are three messages that go out. One of them which says, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment will come sometime in the future. It's not what it says. Fear God, give glory to Him right now. His judgment is going on. Wake up, world. The judgment is happening. He's getting ready to clean up everything. He's determining who will be good tenants in the new Jerusalem. Get ready. And then comes the seven last plagues. And then comes the second coming. We're not going to look at that today. If you have any questions about that, please talk to me. What I'd like to look at is What goes on in this time? Because as a Seventh-day Adventist, sometimes it's easy for me to read one statement out of context and make broad assumptions that either scare me into great activity or move me into great discouragement. I want you to see what this is all about. One of my favorite commentaries says this, The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be what? Clearly understood by the people of God. Why is this? Why do we need to understand the sanctuary and the investigative judgment? All need a what? Knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. We need to go know what Jesus is doing for us right now, right? And why do we need to know according to this? Otherwise, it will be impossible for us to exercise what? The faith which is essential at that time. Do you want to understand this a little bit better? You see, there is a faith that God wants His people to have. A faith where they will lock arms with Him. They will not let him go. They will say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This comes from understanding this. So let's look at the Bible. I want you to turn with me to Leviticus chapter 16. 
Leviticus 16, because the clearest explanation of what goes on on that day happened in the antitypical Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16. And as you go there, I'd like you to imagine. We're looking at the Day of Atonement. Do you know why? Because good Jews today view the Day of Atonement as a day of judgment. How many of you have been to synagogue on Yom Kippur? Anybody here? Anybody? One? Wow. I want to tell you, if you've ever been to synagogue, even in the most liberal of synagogues, this is what you'll find. The Day of Judgment is called the Day... The Day of Atonement is called the Day of Judgment... That's what the Talmud said. The Mishnah says it's a day on which God is seated on his throne to judge the world. At the same time, judge, expert, witness. He opens the book of records. The great trumpet is sounded. The angel shudder saying this is the day of judgment. So the Jews themselves believed that the day of atonement was a day of judgment. So don't let that stop you. Because they believed on that day that everything had to be made right. By the way, you can even tune in. Sometimes CNN will do little clips on Yom Kippur. We'll go to a Jewish synagogue and they will say, well, it's a day in which we put aside our favorite foods in which we lay aside our sins and we think about God and we get our lives together. It's really a, a time of changing one's life. Imagine that you... Well, I'd like to take you in, in, in time several thousand years ago to a farmer out in the field. The heat of summer is long gone. The harvest has been gathered into his granaries and to his storerooms. The nights have gotten longer, the days have gotten shorter and colder. The first hint of rain is coming in the form of clouds sweeping across the sky over the hillsides around Jerusalem and beyond. And the farmer is outside and he's plowing grain, plowing his field. turning up the soil, getting ready for the first rains, getting ready for the replanting of everything. And all of a sudden there's a... It's faint, but it's echoing from hill to valley to canyon. He knows where it comes from. It comes from the city of Jerusalem, miles away. And he rushes and he leaves the plow there. He unhooks the oxen. He ties them up. In the barn, he runs to his wife and children and he says, Honey, are you guys ready? Is the food ready? Yes, everything's ready. We're ready to go. And off they head down one narrow path, finally joining a main road that leads up and up and up until they reach the highlands surrounding the hills of Jerusalem. And by that late afternoon, they're there. They're there at the temple. And they see those priests in sacred rite. They hear the trumpets. And why the trumpets? This is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. It's ten days prior to the Day of Atonement. The judgment is still ten days off. But everybody knew that on this day, the first blowing of trumpets, it was a time to start getting your stuff together. Humble yourself. According to the Bible, it says don't do any work. In fact, there was a penalty, death penalty, for anybody who would work. Massive introspection. Prepare for the day of judgment. Shouldn't this time, when you and I live in the end time judgment, should it not be a time when we also examine ourselves and examine our lives? And we look inward and say, you know, is everything together? 
It's easy to deceive ourselves saying, you know, I'm a good person. But my husband or my wife, well, you know, or everybody else, they're wrong, but I'm okay. But back then, 10 days prior, their trumpet sounded and it was time. Wait a second, wake up. Is everything okay? And unfortunately, we live in a time that's fast-paced, instant everything. I've got an application for this. And everything is, is, is competing for our attention. The television screen, our iPods, our iPads, our computers, our laptops. Everything is competing for a pair of eyes. The hardest thing you and I have ever done, will ever do, is to lay aside all those things and say, you know... This is a day of rest, a time of rest, a time when I need to focus on spiritual things. Am I right with God? The days passed with this family, this far, farmer and his wife in Jerusalem. And then very early, on the Day of Atonement, perhaps at 6 o'clock in the morning, perhaps at the very moment of sunrise, there is another... It's louder this time because they're closer to the Temple Mount. Can you imagine him grabbing his wife and his children and they grab a bite to eat and then they rush to the temple and there they see the temple and white-robed priests rushing about. And they see the high priest in his regal garments performing all of the sacrifices that he performs on any other day. He goes through the daily ritual. Did you get that? Even on the Day of Atonement, the offering for sin was made. You could bring a lamb and say, Lord, I've sinned. Please forgive me. Even during the Day of Judgment, there was time for that. Not always. Because at some point during the day, that intercession would cease. And you tell me when, because I think you'll be able to see it. The priestly duties are finished. The morning sacrifice is completed. And then on the Day of Atonement, a number of things happen. The high priest, and by the way, there have been study groups I've been acquainted with that have spent years just on the sanctuary. We're going through Leviticus 16. A friend of mine actually went to UC Berkeley where his professor spent an entire quarter teaching just on that chapter alone. So all we're getting is an overview, amen? So I'm going to give you the core details. On that day, he puts on white linen. He presents a bull as an offering. He decides which goat is for Jehovah. Let's look at this. Because the first thing about the Day of Atonement that you, I want you to remember is this. If you were there on the Temple Mount, the first thing that you would remember, first of all, is the sound of the trumpet that would be a wake-up call saying, wake up, get your stuff together. The second thing you would look at, realize is that it's all about the priest. Because on that Day of Atonement, you followed the priest. You watched him as he went from here to there, as he changed from the white garments into the priestly garments, into the royal garments, and back into the white garments. As he went from this animal and placed his hands here, as he grabbed incense here and coals from here, you watched him. And finally, as he went into the holiest of all, in fact, as he went into the holiest of all, you couldn't see him, but you know what you could see? You could see a rope like a snake following him as he walked into that holy place. Because you see, when he walked into the most holy place, if he died there, who was going to go get him out? He had a rope tied around his ankle so they could pull him out if needed be. Second thing about the Day of Atonement is it was all about the priest. You kept your eyes on the priest. One of my favorite authors gives an entire passage telling how imperative it is for us to follow Jesus, our great high priest, by faith. Then the priest, 
The next big thing is he came, came back into the court and there are two goats waiting. There in the courtyard, those goats are to be set aside. On his breastplate are the stones Urim and Thummim. And we don't know how they worked. I've tried to find out. I don't know. But evidently, they would ask a question saying, Lord, which of these two goats is your goat, Yahweh's goat? And one of the stones would light up. So this goat is Azazel's goat, and the other stone would light up. And they would discover which one was which, and they would set those apart. And then they would continue on. And after the goats were selected, the bull himself was caught. By the way, this is the second, third big thing about the Day of Atonement. It wasn't just two goats. It wasn't a bull. There were 15 different animals that were slain on the Day of Atonement in addition to the ritual sacrifice that had already been offered at the beginning. And why a bull? Why a bull? Why so many animals? We as humans, do you know how much blood we have circulating in our veins? Maybe a gallon and a quarter, a gallon and a half, maybe two gallons if you're a really big person. Goats, lambs would probably be less. Is that fair? But a bull didn't just have a gallon or two. It had six gallons, a full five-gallon bucket. That's two three-gallon buckets. That's a lot of blood. You see, on the Day of Atonement, there was a wake-up call with trumpets. On the Day of Atonement, it was all about following the priest by faith. On the Day of Atonement, there was plenty of blood. And I want to tell you, on this Day of Judgment, there's plenty of blood. Plenty of blood to cleanse you and I from sin, from any kind of wickedness and addictions that we have, to completely free us. There's plenty of blood. Didn't stop there. After he caught and the bull's blood, he went to the altar of burnt offering with a shovel, a scoop, and he scooped it in deep into those burning embers there, grabbed a, a scoop full of hot coals, and he shoves them in, pours them in to a censer. A censer was just something probably on chains that they carried around. It was essentially a fire pan that was carried. And then with that censer, another priest brings over a big bag of incense, fills out of that bag of incense a small pan overflowing with, little, with incense. How many of you have burned incense before? Have you ever burned incense this way? Well, I want you to think about it because he carries into the holy place this fire pan or this censer filled with embers and a container filled with incense. And he gets to the veil between the holy and the most holy. He goes to the right part of it and he elbows the veil aside and he looks inside and for the first time ever, if he's a brand new priest, and for the first time in the entire year, if he's a seasoned one, he sees the Shekinah glory coming from between the cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant and keeping his eyes with coals in one hand and incense in the other, he steps sideways until he stands right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And do you know what he does? He sets down that incense burner on the ground and he takes that incense and he dumps it onto those coals. And what happens? What happens? You know what happens. Smoke billows up. It's like a volcano. <sighs> There's plenty of incense billowing up. You would say, well, 
interesting. Why the incense? What does incense represent? You would say, oh, it represents prayers, right? Not quite. Because have you ever read Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4? It says, another angel came and stood at the altar having a what? Golden censer. That's a fire pan. And there was given to him how much incense? Oh, friends, I believe this is Jesus Christ who is being given as our great high priest. Much incense. And what does he do with that incense? You tell me. What does he do with the incense? He, he adds it. He offers it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints. Now help me out with something. The incense is different from the prayers. Do you see that? So why do you need incense with prayers? Why do you have incense with anything? How many of you have ever lived in a dormitory room? Any of you? Have you ever burned incense in that dorm room? I have. You know why you burn incense when you're a guy living with a roommate in a dormitory room? And you have different standards of cleanliness than do the other residents of the camp on the other side of the, door, of the college. Do you know why you burn incense? You burn it because it stinks. And you want to make it smell better. So what does this tell you about my prayers and your prayers naturally? Oh, this is a sobering teaching. What does it tell you about my prayers naturally? Oh, they are... They stink. And so what is it that's added to our prayers that makes them acceptable before God? Is it not the merits of of a living Savior that comes and invests His own attributes saying, Father, this is my son, this is my daughter. Hear their prayer. Oh, I love hearing this prayer. Here's my incense to make it acceptable in your sight. And how much incense is offered on the Day of Atonement. Much incense. Because it's not just about the trumpet that wakes everybody up. It's not just about looking at the priest, keeping your eyes on the priest. It's not just about a ton of blood that's available. It's also, finally, or fourthly, the fact that there's much incense. That should tell you, even the Day of of Judgment, there is much of Christ's righteousness and character available to you. I don't know what you struggle with, but Jesus Christ is able to save you to the uttermost. I don't know what addiction you have in your life or what difficulty you are facing in your your marriage because of your own innate selfishness and the selfishness of your partner But there is power in the blood and there is the incense of Christ's own life that he gives to us freely. And on this day, do you know what happened in the the most holy place? Filled with incense. And you know what happened to that incense when it had nowhere else to go? It began to billow over the curtain and it began to spread out into the holy place. And then it began to come out into the courtyard. And as worshipers there with you and your wife and your children, you can look and say... The priest is offering the incense and a little while later you'd see the priest coming out. But he wasn't carrying anything now because it was all back there. And now he came out. And do you know what he would do? It was time for blood. I'm just going to review this. Trumpets. Wake up call. The priest. Keep your eyes on him. Blood. Allow that blood to clean you. The incense, there's much of it available. That priest would come out. The bull would have been slaughtered by now. He would take a little bit of that blood in there and he would repeat the same thing. He would elbow his way into the holiest of all keep his eyes on the Shekinah glory, but it's hard this time because everything is bathed in smoke. He'd move to the center and he'd sprinkle once on the mercy seat and seven times before the ark. And then he would go back out, set the, the the bull's blood on a stand and go out into the courtyard. And the 
goat would now be slaughtered. And he'd take that blood of, the, of Yahweh's, the Lord's goat, back in and he would do the same thing in the holiest of all, sprinkling that blood. But this blood was different. He, this was blood that came from an animal that had never been confessed over. This was cleansing blood. A friend of mine has done an entire doctoral thesis on this. He begged his major professor at Berkeley University just to present this. His name is Roy Gaines. Some of you have heard of him. He's actually gotten his major professor, a Jewish professor, a Jewish professor to consider the possibility that could it be that this blood is actually cleansing and picking up the sins that God's people had confessed throughout the year and putting them back on himself in the holy place, in the most holy, and then at the altar of incense and at the table of showbread, picking up the sins, coming out to the altar and the court, picking up the sins on himself so that when the priest comes out, metaphorically, he has... He is bearing on himself all of the sins of the entire congregation. But he's not going to die for these sins. That atonement had already been made. And do you know what he does next? This is something that really makes us unique as a people. But it is an insight into how God acts that is absolutely amazing. The high priest with great authority, strides into the court and places his hand on the head of a goat. Not the Lord's goat, that's dead. But on the goat of Azazel. And there are commentators today that, even, that will even today tell you that Azazel was the representative of the evil spirit in the wilderness. And this goat was a symbol of, oh, you know who it was, a symbol of Satan himself. Years ago, we would hear Church Lady on Saturday Night Live, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. Friends, the devil does incite, inspire, and provoke sin. He is the ultimate source. And towards the end of the Day of Atonement, when the high priest comes out of the holiest of all, after cleansing all of the temple, bearing the sins, he walks up to Azazel's goat, representing Satan, and he transfers those sins from himself to Satan. And that goat is never killed. That goat never becomes a sacrifice for anybody. But according to Jewish literature, that goat is then led out into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man where he will die. If you were a member of the camp of Israel and you had confessed your sins day in and day out to the sanctuary and the priest had made atonement and by faith had sprinkled the blood-laden sins, your sins in the sanctuary, now, one time a year, by faith, you watch your high priest carry all of the sins, not just of you, but the entire congregation out, lay them on the hands of a goat, and that goat is led away. In what condition is the camp of Israel now? It is now completely clean free of sin. Can you imagine what your home would be like, what this community would be like if there was one day a year when you could say, you know what, it's completely clean. But that wasn't it. Because the high priest threw a number of things and did a number of different things on that day. Let's see if I can get to the next one. He walks into the holiest of all. He retrieves that censer. As he walks into the holy place, the, sense, the incense billowing up, he walks into the courtyard. And you know what he does with that censer? That censer representing intercession, mediation, he takes and he flings the contents down at the base of the altar. And now it's over. 
The camp is clean. Then he has the Levites scurry into the, into the sanctuary and they take down the veil between the holy and the most holy. Because it's blood spattered. But the women of Israel have made a new veil. A new and living veil. The women. Let your mind think about that. And a new veil is put up. And then the high priest come out, comes out and he blesses God's people. And then it's time for a special celebration. And the high priest has a special feast with him and his friends. As we close, look at this. Those who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. You see, she foresaw that we would be tempted to allow something to interrupt or stop our connection with God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, display, or seeking gain, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful what? Friends, the word is transforming. It's powerful. Look at this. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood. We've looked at that. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be what? Impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. I don't want you to be frightened by this. But I want you to focus on the priest. Keep your eyes on the priest. Remember there is much incense. Remember though and hear that trumpet wake up call. So you take advantage of the blood and the incense. We live in a world today in which many Christians say, you know, as long as you believe in Jesus, it's okay. But there's a story told about a colleague of Louis Pasteur's that was working with him on researching germ theory. This colleague, his name was Dr. Rue. Dr. Felix Rue had a granddaughter that had just passed away because of diphtheria in Paris. And he was determined that he was going to find out the cause of his daughter, his granddaughter's death. Diphtheria is a hor was a horrible disease. Any of you know of anybody that's actually gotten diphtheria? One of you, two of you? Okay. Adults, it's not that bad, but for children, it has almost an 80% or higher mortality rate, at least it did back at that time. Anyway, Dr. Felix Rue researched this. He locked himself in his laboratory. The medical association had gotten Pasteur and his colleagues exiled, but they didn't go far because they ended up in the forest outside of Paris. They rebuilt a small research facility and continued his forbidden research. Remember, they're trying to find out how do you stop this disease. By the way, do you know how diphtheria kills? Tissues, extra tissues are created in the throat of the victim. And you end up choking. That's how it kills. That's why it's so fatal in children. At one point, 20 horses are led into the forest to this improvised laboratory. And doctors and nurses and scientists gather around for this experiment. Rue goes to a steel vault, he unlocks it, and he pulls out of that vault, he pulls a bucket filled to the brim with diphtheria germs, enough diphtheria to kill all the children in, in Paris. The scientist takes a special swab and he goes to each horse. He dips that swab in the deadly concoction and he swabs the inside of the horse's mouth, his throat, 
his tongue, his nostrils, and his eyes with diphtheria. After this is done, every single horse gets, comes down with a deadly disease. And all of them, it seems, are about to die. Nineteen of them die. One of them hangs on for a little bit, and most of the scientific staff leave. They think this one's going to die too. But Pasteur and Felix Rue are sleeping in the barn during this time. They have an orderly go and check on the condition of these horses, on this remaining horse, really, and the, telling them, look, wake us up if, any, if there's any change in the temperature of the horse. About 2 o'clock one morning, the orderly runs in, wakes up Dr. Rue and says, guess what? Temperature has fallen a half a degree. The next morning, the horse had another drop of two degrees. By nightfall, the horse is up, standing, eating. He is recovered. He is an overcomer now. He has conquered the deadly disease. And Dr. Rue comes up to that horse with a great sledgehammer and deals a death blow to that horse. Right between his eyes, the horse crumples to the ground. And according to the story, those scientists grab blood. They take the horse's blood, as much of the, as they can carry, and they furiously drive to Paris. When they get there, they go to the municipal hospital. They force their way past the superintendent and the guards and all the way to the special isolation unit where there are hundreds of babies dying from black diphtheria but they have the blood of a horse. And they inoculate every single child. And all but three overcame. They lived. It's an amazing story. You see, the Day of Atonement is all about blood. But that blood is not just an anesthetic that makes us feel good even though we're in the painful world of sin. No, 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 no. It inoculates us. It transforms us. It changes us. It drives out the virulent virus of sin. Will you allow yourself to take advantage of that blood? Father, I ask that your spirit would go with us now as we would leave. Father, on this day of your antitypical atonement. Give us a heart that is open to being transformed. In Jesus' name, amen.